moment. First Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. There's been, in the last several days to weeks, a, a lot of tragic events have occurred. I, I reminded back in 2019, the very last Sunday of that, that year, a, a tragedy befell a, a fellow congregation up in Dallas. I, I remember back in, in around 2000, I believe 16, there outside of Lavernia, T uh, Texas, right outside of, of Sutherland Springs. I, I remember uh, going to that, uh, that church right after the, the massacre, if you will, that, that befell that small congregation, that, that befell that, uh, that town. I remember going to that, that church. I remember seeing the, the white floors, the white walls, the white chairs, the little rows in the chairs where the people lay when they were killed. I remember all of these different instances of, of tragic events, and I, I know some of you are, are dealing with tragedy. Some of you are dealing with grief, and, and so you're, you're trying to wrap your minds around how do you deal with this grief? Some are, are dealing with the, the loss of a child. Maybe, maybe a mentor was, was passed away here recently. Maybe an uncle. Maybe a wife. Or maybe a friend. Others may be dealing with this tragedy only by themselves, inward mourning and, and saying, I don't want to show my emotions. I don't, I don't want to, to show my weakness. And so they choose to do just that. Some, more tragically, are, are dealing with the loss of, of one that maybe have committed suicide. And you're wrapping your mind around, how do we overcome these instances? How do we, how do we handle these instances? Is my, mic, is my mic on? Is my dead? Y'all can hear me all right? Okay. I just want to make sure. I remember back September the 12th, 2017. It's a normal Tuesday morning. I woke up, did everything at the house, was on my way into town, on my way to work at the, the church there in Arkansas. And I remember for some reason, I don't know why, I, I might have been going to drop something off that Jennifer needed. Maybe I was being a good husband and, and, and giving her a cup of coffee because she had been up at, at 4 o'clock in the morning. And it's a long day for those who wake up that early and go and their school teachers. It's, it's hard. And so maybe I was doing, I don't remember what I was doing, but I remember on the way, not far from where her school was, I, I got a phone call from Dad. Yeah, as a typical son would, I'll answer it. Hey, Dad, how are you doing? And he you know, was talking about it. He's like, son, I, I got some news for you. you know, uh, just for precautions, they decided to take uh, your Paul Paul over to the hospital there in, in, in Waynesboro, Tennessee. We don't think it's any big deal, but you know, we're just wanting to let you know. They, they may even take him over to another smaller or another town, a little bit bigger, Columbia, Tennessee, go to the hospital there. They're just doing this precautionary, you know, tale. They're just making sure everything is, is okay. So I was like, all right, just keep me updated, and, and I'll add them to our, our prayer list, and I'll let Jennifer know. So I went down and visited with Jennifer just for a moment. And I, I remember as I got finished there, I actually went across town back to a hospital, and I remember, you know, going in there to a, to a friend who was having surgery, and I remember that conversation, just joking and laughing with with him as he's about to have this surgery and, you know, with him and his family. And I, I remember my, my pocket, my phone started to going off. And I looked down and, and it was dad. And I thought, this, this, this doesn't feel right. And I remember I dismissed myself from the, the, the surgery room, the, the pre-surgery room where they, they get prepared. And I stepped out. I was like, I gotta take this phone call. And, he, and my dad told me, son, I, I don't know how to tell you, but, but we lost your papa. How do you handle those types of phone calls? How do you handle those types of emotions? And I, I simply, you know, I remember I went back into the room. I was like, hey, I, I, got, I have something else to do. I, I need to leave. And so I remember dismissing this. I said, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. And I, I left and I, I called Jennifer and I went over there. How do you handle those moments? Tragedy. Where do you turn when you receive those different types of phone calls, how do you react when the love of your life passes away from cancer? 
How, how do you handle a situation where you simply go into your child's bedroom, your two-year-old son, and then you try to wake him up, but mysteriously he has passed away over the night? Where do you turn? How do you handle someone, a friend, a, a, a teen that you had, how do you handle someone that has committed suicide? There's many different verses that you can turn to for, for you know, comfort. There's many different passages that you can go to where you can find different comforts and how to deal with grief. But I love what Paul says here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I, I love this passage because you see, you know, we... We can relate to the church there in Thessalonica. They, they had different questions, and Paul's response to them is very plain and simple. We, we see this instance where Paul begins to answer a question that they have, and, and we pick up in verse 13, and it says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. You know, when, when Paul was writing this letter back in chapter 13, we read how Paul, you know, even was... After he was ran out of Thessalonica, ran out of Berea, down to Athens, over to Corinth. After all of those instances, he was wondering about this church in Thessalonica. He says, I need to hear from them. I need to know what's going on. And so he sent Timothy and Silas back over there to Thessalonica to hear what was going on. And one of the things that Timothy reported back to him is like, they have questions, as we all do. One of the questions was, is, is what happens to those who are already passing away? What happens to those Christians who are falling? Can you relate to that? Maybe you've wondered those same types of questions. What about my loved one who's passed away? What do they do? What happens to their body? What happens to their soul? So Paul simply says, look, we're writing to you so that, that you're not uninformed we want you to know what is going to happen in the last days we want you to know what's going to happen when Jesus comes back again look I, I know you're mourning I, I, I know you're sad I miss them too and he says here as we continue on in verse 13 that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Who have no hope. Can you, can you imagine having no hope? You know, ancient writings, you can read and you can hear all these different tales and all these different writings of what's going on, and you can hear these people say, you know, once you live, you die, and that's it, nothing else. Some people say, well, you'll, you'll be back into the ground, you're becoming a tree or whatever. You live, you die, nothing else happens. Where's the hope in that? When someone that you love, someone that you've been married to for 40, 50 years dies, where is the hope if all they did was live and die and there's nothing else? Paul is saying, look, I want you to grieve, but I want you to grieve as some who have hope. There's something else beyond this world. You know, we see Paul wanting to inform the brothers here. There, there could have been, potentially because of the city that Thessalonica was, there could have been mis, uh, false information coming into the city. Oh, you know, don't worry about what Paul is saying. All these new fangled religions are coming into place. All these different things. That could have very well been happening in Thessalonica. But Paul writes, look, I don't want you to be uninformed. There is something better. There is something greater at the end of life. I want you to pause, and, and, and I want you to really think about something for a second. H how depressing is it for those who believe there's nothing after death? How depressing is that thought for those who are dealing with tragedy? I can't imagine that. I, I can't fathom that, that, that idea. But one thing is certain, there's, there's good news. 
There's good news at the end. But if, if you really look at the good news, there's also bad news. There's a famous line. I never thought I would end up quoting a, a, a line from Avengers. I wish Stephen was here because he might get a kick out of it. There's a line of one of those movies that came out, the, the main bad guy in those series, where he looks at the Avengers and he tells them, I am inevitable. I, I want to tell you something. Death is inevitable. We all die. We all, at some point in our life, have to deal with the loss of someone that we love so dearly. So my question is, is how do we do it? How do we handle it? Well, I think the first thing that we have to understand is, is that Paul mentions our hope. There's a hope afterwards. Notice that he says, you know, grieve as those who have uh, actual hope. And notice this hope is not based in anything that we have to accomplish. Notice this hope is not based in our own abilities. This hope is not based in our own strength, our own might, our own in intellectual business. It's, it's not based in that. But our, our hope is based in none other than Jesus Christ himself. It says, if you read with me, continue on in verse 14, it says here, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, though through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Notice where the hope lies. We believe that Jesus died. We believe that Jesus rose again. And on that death, that burial, and that resurrection, and His ultimate ascension into heaven, that is where our hope lies. The reason why we can grieve as ones who have hope, the reason why we can be in the funeral homes of those Christian brothers and sisters who have lived a faithful and long life. The reason why, yes, I'm sad that I lost my papa. The reason why I sat there and listened to all of the words of all the people in that community coming in and telling us what he meant to that community. The reason why I can live my life because I know that he is finally where he needed and wanted to go, and that's heaven. There's no doubt in my mind that he earned his reward. We lost Clayton Soline just a few weeks ago. It's a tragedy for us here, for the people and the lives that he touched. There was sadness in our hearts. There's sadness in the families, but they all knew one thing. That he earned his reward in heaven. That's how we grieve as one who has hope. Because our hope is in Jesus Christ coming back and collecting the faithful again. And we see that this coming of the Lord is, is not going to be done in silent. Those that we see here, if we continue on reading, is, is very plainly spoken here from Paul. It says here in verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet. The Lord himself will come back to collect those who are faithful. Everyone will know what is happening. It's not going to be done in secret. There's not going to be some massive battle between good and evil when Jesus comes back. Satan's army is not going to rise up against him and try to defeat Jesus Christ and his armies. It's not going to happen that way. When Jesus comes, notice the text. Those who have already fallen asleep will rise to meet Him in the air. Those loved ones who've gone on before us, those Christians who've gone on before us, will rise from the dead and meet our Lord in the air. We who are faithful, we who are baptized believers, we who are Christians, 
will likewise join those who have gone on before us and meet our Lord and Savior in the air. It never once says that Jesus Christ himself is going to touch foot on this earth again, but yet we are going to him. What hope do we have in that? How, make, how does that make you feel? To know that we will be called and that we're going to meet him in the air. That's such encouraging words. If we continue on reading down in verse 18, it says, Therefore encourage one another with these words. What more encouraging words can you say to a Christian family who just lost a Christian brother or a Christian sister or mother? We'll be reunited one day. We need to write those words in our heart. We need to share those words with others. But as I said, there's some good news. And it's good news. There's good news to know that, yes, we grieve here on earth. Yes, we, we have sorrow on this earth. But it's not all good news. As we start to close this evening, I want to leave us with really two application points. The, the first question that I have, we sing this song sometimes, my hope is built on nothing less. So the question is, is where is your hope? What is your hope based in? Is your hope based on your own abilities, your own, I'm going to get that word right, intelligence? Your own might, your own strength, is your, is your hope based on your material blessings that you have, the cars you drive, the, the house you live in, the clothes that you wear, your popularity status in school, at work, on social media? Where is your hope? Because if you base your hope in all of those different instances, that will fall and that will fade away. My car once was nice. It was a top of the line Chevy Cruze. Heated leather seats, which you don't need in South Texas, but it had heated leather seats, a Bose sound system, super nice car. Bluetooth, great car. 150,000 miles later, there's a leak in the oil. The tires are falling apart. There's a big yellow dash on the side panel on the rear because a telephone pole popped up when I was backing out. That car is not as valuable as it once was. Those things fade, those things fall, those things fall into disrepair. But if our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, on the fact that God is going to say, Jesus, I want you to go and to get my children, if our hope is built on that, God will never let us down. We will never fall. The next thought is something kind of near and dear to my heart. We, we talk about this lesson about those who have passed away of a Christian brother. We, we said it's good news, but bad news. The second application point is there's, there's going to be people out there who pass away outside of the body. There's going to be people out there that you know, that I know, that die without committing their life to God. I've experienced it, and I, I'm still wrestling with the idea of how do we overcome those ideas. I, we're still wrestling with how do we overcome that situation. We, we don't know every detail, but yeah, I miss them. Those feelings of regret of not sharing that message, those, those feelings of not taking that step of faith and saying, look, I've got a message I want to tell you. It's, it's dire. I need you to know. I need you to hear this message. The fact that there are going to be people who die outside of the body, those people who die out of 
you know, not giving their life over to Jesus, that should motivate us to go and find them. Because I know a couple instances in my life where it's been too late. I'm sure if you're honest with your life, you may realize there's a couple instances in your life where it's been too late. I want to encourage you. Yes, you know, we, we grieve as ones who have hope in the instance of a brother who's, who's gone on to his eternal reward or sister who's gone on to his eternal reward, but I encourage you to find those whom you know. And I'm sure there's names popping up in your head of those who I need to talk to. I want you to find them. I want you to talk to them. I want you to send them a text. If you send them to a, send them a text now, say, look, I, I love you. I want you to know about the joy that we share in Jesus. Talk to them this week. Don't let a day go by where you don't reach out to them and say, I love you. I want to share with you the good news of my Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, I know there's some who are struggling with death there's some who are struggling with a, a, a dark depression there's some who are dealing with some some deep issues in life i know it i want you to know that we love you that we care for you and we want you to come and to talk to us if we can help you in any way come Maybe if you are ready and you, you're, you're hearing the message of Jesus and you say, I, I need hope. Look, I'm outside of the body of Christ. I need that, that, that hope. I know at some point in my life I'm going to die. Yes, I need to be baptized. I need to study about the Word. I need to study about my Lord. I need to study about God. Don't leave here tonight in the state of being lost. Come and talk to us. Let us study with you. If you need to, we'll baptize you tonight. Even if it's at 12 o'clock at night, we'll round people up to baptize you. Don't leave here outside of Christ. If you have a need, come.